Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 135, October 16th to October 22nd, 1863. Last week, we headed back to Virginia after spending some extended time in Tennessee and Georgia. We fought the Battle of Bristow Station, part of some of the lesser-known actions between Gettysburg and the Wilderness. This week, we will jump around a little bit, spending some time in Virginia, Florida, and North Carolina. We will start off today, though, by checking in on some personnel changes in the Army of the Cumberland and the Army of Tennessee. Before we do that, though, just want to talk a little bit about the Patreon, and uh, we had a memoir review that we had posted there that should be live, as well as we had a string of movie reviews, and if any of that sounds like it interests you, whether we're talking about some historical accuracy in movies, and also we have some memoirs, we just did uh, one from Custer's Michigan Cavalry Brigade, and that's already been in our story here, and uh, obviously Gettysburg and leading up into what will become the Overland Campaign of 1864 as well. They're going to be pretty active, so they're going to be in our story a lot. We talked about that. And if that sounds like something that would interest you, just to kind of have a brief synopsis of that and the things I like, the things I didn't like, then by all means, the link to the Patreon is in the show description. And of course, those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. They're greatly appreciated. Some of the significant fallout from the Battle of Chickamauga would be a shakeup in the officers for both the Union and Confederate armies. We will start first with the Federals. Chickamauga would spell the end for the careers effectively for Thomas Crennenton and Alexander McCook. If we take a look at both of them leading into that disaster, called as such by Charles Dana, who reported it was another bull run, it is not hard to see why exactly they got the axe. Crennenton has been non-existent in the battles leading up to Chickamauga. If you go back to, say, Perryville or Stones River, his name really is not called on that much. Arguably, his work at the River of Death is his best as a corps commander, but really, we should also point out, this good performance is really because he just feeds units into Thomas and to his part of the flank. He leaves the field, and like other officers, will not try to return. McCook has been skating on thin ice for some time. He was victimized at Perryville, and his command was smashed at Stones River. Now he turned in the worst performance of the three corps commanders, leaving the field and drawing a pistol on a civilian to save his own skin. That certainly is not a good look. Amazingly, a court of inquiry would find that Crennenton and McCook were relatively okay in their actions. James Negley was also acquitted, surprisingly enough, even though he left the field without orders. If you remember, he takes with him some units and artillery, especially, that could have been pretty useful in the defense of Snodgrass Hill and Horseshoe Ridge, and if he had stayed there, if he had put up more of a defense and added into the units that Thomas already gathered, then I know we like to play the what-if game or a lot, at least I do. It might have been a stretch to say that the Confederates would have been successful if there had been additional reinforcements, additional ammunition coming in, if there had been some kind of rallying by anyone, right? Rosecrans needs to get back to Chattanooga to uh, start setting up the defense there. And then McCook and Crenton just kind of go with them. But if anybody had been trying to rally any of these troops to head back to Thomas, and if Negley had been there, then things could have been very different. None of the officers would hold a relevant field command for the remainder of the war. So that will lead us to the Army commander. William Stark Rosecrans is important to hold on to for a spell because of his strong Ohio connections. If you recall, the Peace Democrats had a realistic chance of gaining governorship of the important state, so keeping him in line until the election was in hand would be crucial. Once the returns looked good, Rosecrans would be removed and Thomas put in his place. McCook's and Crennenden's corps would be consolidated, with Gordon Granger placed in command. This corps now designated the 4th. 
The 14th Corps would be taken by Senior Officer John Palmer. Now, the decision would not be Lincoln's. Remember that the President still was grateful for the service of his commander, Stones River being an important victory. Ulysses S. Grant would be given effective control over all the armies of the West, including the Army of Tennessee, Army of the Ohio, and now the Army of the Cumberland. Whether Rosecrans remained the general in charge of the latter would be up to Grant. Now, this must have been a tough decision for Liss, as it was either Rosie or Old Pap Thomas, neither of whom were saved in a warm place in his heart. Rosecrans had been difficult, if you recall, while his subordinate in Mississippi. Thomas, who to be fair did not think Grant was all that good of an officer, was held in contempt by Grant for briefly taking charge of his army of Tennessee during the Siege of Corinth. So tough call, but for the case of Thomas, he had turned in a good performance at Stones River, as well as Chickamauga, saving the Army of the Cumberland in both cases, so he was allowed to take over for Rosecrans on the 19th. Without addressing his troops, Old Rosie would take off for Cincinnati. So, you know what that means. We need to talk a little bit about Rosecrans and try to place it all in perspective. It takes some research, I think, to really appreciate Rosecrans as a general. So great is the stigma of defeat at Chickamauga, you often discount his other achievements. In West Virginia, he would turn in some good performances early in the war. While in Mississippi, he does pretty well at Iuka and Corinth. In the case of the Second Battle of Corinth, there could have been a disaster, but the defense held. Stones River could have likewise been a disaster, but he holds the army together there too. Tullahoma and Chattanooga were both good campaigns of maneuver that kept casualties at a minimum and still pushed the enemy back. Over eager, Rosecrans would make a mistake by pushing on without consolidating his army. It is commendable that he places emphasis on technology, including repeating rifles and railroads, something that might have appealed to the technology-interested Lincoln. Like other generals of the war, though, he does bump heads with the War Department, Lincoln, and Halleck. This is all well and good when you are successful, but the minute you lose, it's going to be a problem. Remember that it takes a while for him to move? It's kind of like... McClellan, I guess, in that regard. However, in the case of Rosecrans, he does come up with pretty good ideas in terms of how to maneuver, and he does adapt as well. So, were these well-thought-out plans good ideas? I think so. We need to keep that in mind. At the time, he was considered to be perhaps the best general officer in the Union, and despite his one major setback, that really is saying something. Personally, overall, I think it's kind of a bittersweet ending to Rosecrans' but I'll let you formulate your own opinion. It would not just be the Union Army who would have changes following Chickamauga. Bragg had finally had enough of some of his malcontents, even if they had presidential backing. Thomas Heinemann was punished for his failure at Macklemore's Cove and removed. Most significantly, Bishop Polk was also sent to Atlanta. Polk had not decided to go out of his way for Bragg, but it's hard to argue he obeyed all his orders. Crucially, he had disobeyed orders at Perryville, and he twice rebuffed Bragg during the Chickamauga campaign and during the battle itself. Bragg would then start to mix up some of his officers, trying to break up those hostile to him. Frank Cheatham, for instance, is removed from his division of Tennessee regiments, a severe blow to their morale. If you think about it too, they've Tennessee regiments, and we kind of talked about this with Sam Watkins and his memoirs, they were already having morale issues because they had been pushed out of Tennessee effectively, right? And even though there was this victory, morale was still kind of low. So taking away somebody that you really liked as your as your general officer, eh, it's probably not the best idea, even if he's trying to break up these pockets of of officers who are going to be against him. So they're not all together. So he's kind of pairing... It's called like a like a weird kind of buddy system, like guys who are neutral or otherwise supportive of him, then he's going to try to pair them up together. A letter to Jefferson Davis would call for Bragg's removal. D.H. Hill, Simon Bolivar Buckner, 
Polk, of course, and James Longstreet would be the primary anti-Bragg men, with Old Pete taking the lead. Now this is sort of unfortunate for Longstreet, who cannot separate himself from the intrigue, probably leading him to not getting to take over for Bragg. If you were Davis, though, why are you sticking with this North Carolinian? It is a perplexing question, but with a lot of malcontents, it would seem it could be kind of like children. Like, why give in to any of the complainers and their demands? Well, to make things awkward, Davis will end up visiting the army and get everyone in the same room. With Bragg in a corner, the generals were allowed to voice their complaints, mostly that their commander was incompetent. Now, speaking from an HR perspective, this really is not going to be the best way to go about it, especially with Davis deciding to leave Bragg at the helm. Predictably, D.H. Hill will be removed without really getting a reason as to why from Bragg. He's going to go back to the bench and he will be picked up for later campaigns. Now, was this the right decision? I mean, D.H. Hill really doesn't even put in all that good of a performance during the Chickamauga campaign, so that one kind of makes sense. He's not directly responsible, but at least partly responsible for the attack on the third day, not jumping off when it should have, right? So he probably should have been removed, and it's actually kind of questionable as to why he's even thrown into the mix in the first place. Buckner will be benched as well, his men given to Longstreet. Longstreet, we will see, be in charge of an independent movement, but failed to shine in that role, so all chances of taking the reins of the army would be washed away. Just know that Hardy will return, Breckenridge will remain in the mix-ups during the siege of Chattanooga, and amazingly, Wheeler will be left in his role due to his loyalty to Bragg. While he will go on to turn in an okay performance, he was not the aggressive go-getter that Forrest was. Forrest would be given an independent command in Mississippi. How different could things have been if Davis had taken Bragg away from his role? But on the other hand, there were not too many appealing options, as we have talked about before. There is a lot that goes into running an army, a Civil War army, right? And there's very select few individuals who can do it effectively. And at least, and we'll get there when we talk about Bragg and his legacy, if you will, but... He does do a good job of organization. He does take an army that had essentially been smashed at Shiloh, and he does rebuild it, and he's able to turn in at least um, some decent offensive actions uh, as well. Let's head back to Virginia and check in with the Eastern Theater now. When we last left off, the Confederates had failed to inflict a loss on the Army of the Potomac as they retreated away from Culpeper Courthouse. A.P. Hill had launched an ill-advised attack that would see heavy casualties at Bristow Station. What was worse, the enemy was allowed to escape, and now had set up around Centerville, which, over the course of the war, had been ringed with defenses. Lee, with his numerically inferior army, would not be able to launch an attack, although the Federals feared he would flank them. In fact, it was a legitimate fear that the Army of Northern Virginia would swing out into the valley and perhaps launch another invasion of the North. Now, would it have been wise to do so without Longstreet? Probably not. But Meade was unaware of the intentions of his enemy, so everything was on the table. It is another example, I think, of Lee throwing his weight as a superior general, sort of just doing what he wanted to do, although facing long odds, managing to keep his foe on the back foot. Washington, as you could imagine, was not happy. The armies had only recently been across the Rappahannock, but now they were back in the same vicinity where Pope had met with disaster, closer to the capital. Halleck, though, still refused to really give clear direction, as was his M.O., prompting a frustrated me to offer up his resignation. We go back to the point that while Meade maybe was not the guy to truly defeat Lee, he was the most capable commander the army had seen in some time. So for the moment, he would remain. While Meade pondered his next move and threw some telegrams back and forth with Halleck, Lee decided that he would withdraw. Stuart had combined his cavalry and tried to pick off the enemy baggage train and maybe get into Meade's rear, but this would prove unsuccessful. 
Leaving Stuart where he was to cover the movement south, Ewell's troops would destroy the railroad, which would slow down the rail-dependent enemy, especially given the state of the country of Northern Virginia, stripped of its resources. On October 18th, Meade was resolved to advance out against the enemy, although he was unsure if Lee was indeed retreating. Cavalry would probe down his two chosen routes of advance to the south. Stewart's cavalry would give ground, Kilpatrick pressuring Hampton's division, and Wesley Merritt moving on Fitz Lee's. So close were the Federal horsemen that George Armstrong Custer eats Pierce Young's meal prepared for him by a household along Broad Run. Custer's horsemen would skirmish with the Confederates across the run, but the rebels would soon give way as a result. Kilpatrick, aggressive as always, would order Custer to pursue. The Wolverines were tired, though, and needed to eat, as well as feed their horses. Davies would be dispatched to move on Stuart, Custer remaining at a place called Buckland Mills, with orders to move up once his troops were sustained. For Kilpatrick's cavalry division, this would actually be quite fortunate. Custer's brigade would run into Fitz Lee as he attempted to cut off the Yankee line of retreat. You see, Lee had suggested to his chief that they could spring a trap on the enemy, with Lee moving on Buck on Mills and Stuart turning to face his would-be pursuers. As a result, Custer would see tremendous pressure, complete with artillery duels. Stuart would turn Hampton's division around and plunge at the Union troopers, catching the 2nd New York by surprise. We have some descriptions of the fighting from the Confederate perspective and Union perspective as well. First, we have a Confederate account here. In a few moments more, the whole command were down upon the Federals with drawn sabers. The whole line emptied their pistols and carbines upon our devoted heads, and then deliberately wheeled around and galloped off. The volley, of course, checked our speed and produced some confusion all through our advanced lines. But in an instant, the charge was again sounded, and the pursuit continued. Here we also have somebody from the 2nd New York Cavalry. The onset was terrible, and we were taken completely by surprise. The Harris Light Cavalry had been in front while advancing, by this sudden evolution was thrown in the rear, and thus compelled to meet the desperate charges of the enemy in pursuit. Reaching a little rise and crowd in the road, we made a stand, and for some time checked the advancing rebels, by pouring into their ranks deadly volleys from our carbines and revolvers. Here we have another account here. But it was all in vain. Panic seized them. The cohesion of their drill, discipline, and organization was, for the time, destroyed. An individual effort amounted to nothing. Break they must, and break they did. And yet every time we ran into them, they fought like brave men. And I verily believe that if we had given them two minutes more before taking the start, we would have had the fight of our lives for the possession of that road. As it was, the front wavered, their column melted and broke, and though they made frequent rallies and attempts to reform, we gave them no time. Sabres and pistols were freely used by both sides in the melee which followed every time they were attacked from the rear. The second New York would engage in a running fight, as would the remaining regiments in their brigade, which would move back toward Custer, but not completely connect with him. Custer would escape across Broad Run, with Kilpatrick going with him. Embarrassingly for the young general, his headquarters wagon was captured, which included letters to his wife. In addition, a section of the Wolverines were left behind and cut off. There are mixed reports of the Union troopers being panicked in their flight versus being more controlled. Davies would have to make a mad dash for freedom, giving this engagement its name, Buckland Races, although the name also derives from the boost in Confederate morale, as we will soon see. In fact, Davies was guided by a doctor who would get them across Broad Run, some of the troopers becoming disorganized at the waterway. Stuart and Lee would chase after their foes, Stuart actually deciding to launch a night assault on members of Newton's First Corps before withdrawing. This would actually result in a capture of a handful of infantry, adding to the total casualty figures. All told, Union losses, including a large amount of men captured, were 392 compared to around 41 total Confederates. Stuart had not succeeded in completely annihilating the enemy, but he did make a bit of a statement when faced with the growing parody of his blue-clad counterparts. Kilpatrick, on the other hand, did do one thing, and that was to blame his almost disastrous and no less humiliating defeat on the fact that rebel infantry were present. This would lead Meade to question Lee's intentions, as he did during the entire campaign. As a result, the Army of Northern Virginia was able to escape back to the Rappahannock, doing significant damage to the railroad. 
With Buckland races, the Bristow Station campaign officially came to a close. All told, it was a missed opportunity for both sides. Meade had the numerical advantage, but he was hampered by indecision. He is unable to concentrate his forces against Lee, in many instances effectively trying to act offensively and defensively at the same time. It does not help that Halleck, Lincoln, and Stanton are all proving difficult as they had with other commanders, maybe giving Meade a glimpse into what those he criticized had to deal with. Lee, on the other hand, could not have done significant damage to the Army of Potomac. Hill is the victim of lack of proper intelligence at Bristow Station, but imagine bagging the entire Second Corps. This could have been done, as could the entirety of Kilpatrick's cavalry been destroyed. Lee would be disappointed. I view Bristow Station as a lot of movement with some aggressive swings, but really in the end, with the exception of casualties lists on both sides, nothing is really gained. On October 16th, we have action at Fort Brooke in Tampa, Florida. Now, it's been a while, but remember that Fort Brooke was shelled earlier in the war and the surrender of the town demanded. It was not really that strategic, however, so it's fairly low on the priority list for the U.S. Navy. In 1863, however, Tampa would be the location for two blockade runners, the Kate Dale and Scottish Chief. These would be funded by Tampa Mayor James McKay. McKay was also important in trying to organize cattle to send for the Confederate war effort. Remember that this is probably the more important contribution on the part of Florida to the rebel war machine. McKay had previously been captured and released, but as with other prisoners having taken the oath of allegiance, violation of which would mean death. Alexander Alderman Sims would be commanding the Union blockade in this region, which included the USS Tahoma and USS Adela, already both used as hunters for any potential rebel supply dashers. Now the name Sims should sound familiar, as this was the cousin of Raphael and Paul, both serving for the Confederacy. In October, Alexander would devise a bold plan. His two ships would bombard Fort Brooke, while a landing party would go ashore and inflict as much damage as possible to the shipyard. October 16th would see that plan go into action. At this point, you should probably not be surprised that the Federal cannon were superior, and therefore they were able to stay out of range while also proving a necessary distraction. The 100-man landing party would make their way inland from a spot called Ballast Point. They would be aided by loyal Florida citizens and make their way to the shipyard. From there, they would miss out on recapturing James McKay, but do significant damage to the two runners. In fact, the Kate Dale would sink, whereas the Scottish chief was towed away for attempted repair. The steamer A.B. Noise was also damaged in the raid. Confederate troops were alerted to the landing party and dispatched to try to catch them, which included regular and irregulars. They would do so at Ballast Point, both sides suffering around 20 casualties, which is fairly high for the small numbers having been engaged. I have seen where some of the Confederates disguise themselves as enslaved peoples to try to fool the Union sailors, but I have also seen where that event was connected with a separate instance, so I'm not positive that happened on the 16th. The Union Navy claimed success having accomplished their objective, and destroyed most of the town of Tampa as a result. Despite a Union occupation later in the war, this would be the most important action for this town. On October 20th, 1863, we have a skirmish at Warm Springs, North Carolina. While we will get into the Knoxville campaign in a future episode, we did mention in a prelude to Chickamauga that Ambrose Burnside had advanced on Knoxville and taken the city. Facing him at the time was a numerically inferior force under Simon Bolivar Buckner. Buckner, as we know, was reassigned to join Braxton Bragg's army, where he does pretty much nothing during the second largest battle of the war, and afterwards continues his feud with his commanding officer. While the capture and liberation of East Tennessee was high on the wish list of Lincoln, as we have mentioned before. As we also have mentioned, a combination of Burnside's contingent with that of Rosecrans was deemed to be a big setback on the part of the Confederacy. This is because while Burnside does not have a small force, he doesn't really have a large army either. 
It is deemed to be small enough, in fact, to be overwhelmed by James Longstreet, as we will see in a future episode. While in Knoxville, Burnside will not be idle. It is close enough to North Carolina to make trouble in that state. We have talked before about how North Carolina, especially in the western part of the state, will be more inclined to be pro-union. Keeping this in mind, raids and forays into that state would be a good course of action by the Federals. Standing against these incursions would not be regular army units, but rather state and irregular forces. Commanding such forces would be Major John Woodfin, a former lawyer from North Carolina. Woodfin would have already met Burnside's forces during the coastal campaign, acting in the same capacity of state troops. He will be killed at Warm Springs in a skirmish with Union troops. Additional North Carolina forces commanded by R.B. Vance, the brother of Governor Zebulon Vance, would attempt to trap the enemy, but the trap was not fulfilled, and the enemy troops were allowed to escape. This gives us at least a little glimpse into the war in this area. It also should point out to us that this would be why governors of a state like North Carolina would be pressuring Davis to give them support. It is more than likely undermining the government. It is a pretty large contrast to that of Lincoln, who is calling for more men, while at the same time, these state and irregular forces are stretched very thin, protecting the southern interior. Let's pause there for now. We had to say goodbye to William Stark Rosecrans today. Despite some positives, he is not going to be able to work through a disaster like Chickamauga. We wrapped up the Bristow Station campaign today with Buckland Races. While we are not necessarily done campaigning in Virginia in 1863, this has given us a good idea about what's going on since Lee slips back into Virginia following the Gettysburg actions. We had naval action at Fort Brook in Tampa, and we had smaller scale action in North Carolina. Next week, we will continue to jump around a bit, spending some time in Arkansas, Louisiana, and then begin the operations to relieve the Union forces at Chattanooga. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.